Hey, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. With me today is Dave Asprey, who is an entrepreneur, a four-time New York Times bestselling science author, host of Bulletproof Radio, and the founder of Bulletproof Coffee. He is a leading voice in the movement to take control of our own biology. News outlets like the Today Show, CNN, Wired, Good Morning America, Dr. Oz, and more have featured Dave because he's considered the father of biohacking because he started the movement and hosts the largest and longest running biohacking conference. So this is a wide range in conversation and uh, we touch on a lot of topics and Dave has a lot of really good things to say and insightful things to say. So I hope you enjoy the episode. So welcome, Dave. Such a pleasure to have you on. I'm really happy to be here, Ari. Cool. So first of all, my audience may not be totally familiar with your world. I know that in my, in my members Facebook group, the topic of biohacking has come up here and there. And sometimes I get these reactions from especially people who are a bit older, maybe they're in their 50s, their 60s, 70s, and they, they hear this word biohacking and they go, Oh my God, that sounds awful. What, what is this horrible thing? Bio, like, is this turning me into a cyborg or something? So first of all, I, I'm sure you've answered this question a million times before, but what is biohacking? Why do you put such a big focus on it? Uh, you're, you're pretty much the pioneer of this. And you're also a big proponent of being able to control what goes in or what does not go in your body. Um, so talk to me about that. Talk to, tell everybody what biohacking is. Sure. Biohacking is a movement that I started at 10, actually 11 years, 12 years ago now in 2010. And it became a new word in the English language in 2018 in Merriam Webster's dictionary. And my name's actually in there, which is pretty cool. So the original definition was the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so you have full control of your own biology. And just full disclosure, I spent almost 20 years running an anti-aging nonprofit research group in Silicon Valley. Many of the biohacking techniques come straight out of 80 year olds feeling like they're 50. But it turns out if you do those when you're 30, you outperform all of your friends. <laughs> <laughs> because they actually make you have more energy. So the whole basis of biohacking was born in part from anti-aging, but the thing that made me mad was I could never get the anti-aging friends I had, some of whom were three times my age teaching me their secrets, how do I get them to talk to the neuroscientists and to talk to the bodybuilders <laughs> and the hormone experts and the Navy SEALs and the astronauts? Because these are the areas, oh, and Olympic athletes. Right? These are the areas where we're pushing the very edges of, of human biology, what we can do. You'll notice none of those was, how do I replace my eyes with laser range finders and get rockets for arms and whatever else. So I, I draw a line between grinders, which is a word for people who are doing do-it-yourself implants and I would, you know, body modification stuff. I support your right and your freedom to do anything you want. In fact, a very good skin cancer reduction strategy is to cut off your arms and legs so you have less skin, so you get less skin cancer. Okay. I think you'd be very bad at science if you did that, but hey, it's your right to be stupid, right? And, and that's one of the most fundamental things the government does is it protects your ability to make decisions that everyone else thinks are crazy. Because if, if you don't have that right, you stop innovation right there. When I told people I'm going to live to at least 180, assuming a truck doesn't hit me or something, uh, here's why I think it's possible. Here's the New York Times bestselling book with references and all the seven things we know you have to maintain. Well, in order to do something like that, you have to have the right to say that you can do that and the right to talk about it. And so right now I'm pretty high on the free speech horse because we're having unprecedented censorship about how to take care of our own biology. And Ari, I used to weigh 300 pounds. I had all the diseases of aging before I was 30. The cognitive dysfunction, arthritis, high risk of stroke and heart attack, prediabetes, fibromyalgia, and I've come back from all that and I'm better now when I'm 28% of my forecasted minimum lifespan um, than I was when I was a lot younger. Okay, so you mentioned this 180 mark of you wanna to live to be 180. So At least, people always wanna give me a ceiling, it's a floor. <laughs> Okay, so why 180? Why not 730 or 130? 
Well, what, I don't want people the, the rationale. I don't want people to think I'm crazy, so I just picked a low number. Okay. <laughs> uh, here's why. Today, our current best is about 120. It's slightly over 120. Okay, these are people who were born before World War One. Okay, we fought World War One, a lot of it on horseback. We had our first biplanes that we used in World War One. Just a few of them. <laughs> We didn't have antibiotics. We couldn't spell DNA because we didn't know what it was. The world was incredibly different. Uh, we didn't have microwave ovens. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have PubMed, which is an online site where you can look at the sum of human medical knowledge for free. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so if they can do 120, don't you think that you and I might be able to do just 50% better in the next 100 years with artificial intelligence and machine learning and all this stuff? My biggest concerns are frankly environmental. Will we run out of topsoil, which happens in about 60 years, and that is a big carbon sink, and that's what we eat? And will we run out of water? Those are the two things. And will we spray glyphosate and other things um, or just make large scale population decisions that are not in our best interest long term that look good short term and cause problems? So this this comes down to how do we keep our Petri dish clean? So th there's a it, within the natural health movement, which I would say I, I'm definitely a part of, I would say you're. I don't know what you perceive of yourself, but you're kind of a part of it, but also in a way kind of not because the biohacking thing is so, so much about innovation, technological innovation and, and mm. things like that. What, what would you say as far as your, do you, do you identify as being part of the natural health movement? Oh, I'm, I'm one of the biggest influencers in it. I would say if yeah. you go to whole foods and you look for grass fed, anything, mm -hmm. I'm going to raise my hand and say, I was probably the loudest voice making that happen yeah. uh, with, with my writing you know, for New York times bestsellers and just constantly beating the bush. I live in an organic permaculture farm with 25 mm -hmm. pigs and 25 sheep and three cows and a bunch of chickens. And we actually feed our local community. Uh, so I'm very much a part of it because it turns out biohacking is like, look, stop doing the things that make you weak and do more of what makes you strong. Okay, so I've taught, oh, 70,000 people how to do intermittent fasting uh, because that was the topic of my last book. It's like fastwithdave.com. I'll just teach you how to do it for free because this is something everyone should know. And if I'd have known it when I weighed 300 pounds, I wouldn't have weighed 300 pounds and you don't have to suffer. And sleep hygiene, one of the first guys out there saying, hey, the color of the light really matters, that was me. So these are all natural health ideas. But what we had in natural health was, I'm gonna say some toxic beliefs, like a plant-based diet is somehow morally, ethically, or health-wise superior to a diet that includes animals. Those are false. What biohacking does is we say, let's make a change, let's measure it. And when I say measure it, so I'm wearing an aura ring right now. I'm an investor advisor to the company, but I was also the CTO and co-founder of the first company to get heart rate from your wrist 10 years ago before I started Bulletproof and all the other companies I've started. So I'm all about, hey, if it works, prove it to me. And what mm -hmm. we're finding is almost everything that big food wants you to do, more vegetable oil, more seed oil, more grains, all of those things create human weakness. Now, does that mean I'm part of natural health? No. I am part of what works health. I will measure it. And it just turns out natural health works a lot better most of the time. But we also do stuff like eat kale and think it's healthy. Kale is a garnish. It's not a food. And once we get that down, we'll all be healthier. Stuff like that matters, but you can measure it. Excellent. So that, that was an excellent explanation of kind of where I wanted to go, but maybe we can elaborate just a bit more. Sure. Um, yeah, on the one hand, I think there's a lot of people who are fascinated with technology and who are of the opinion that it's all about living better with technology. That's the answer. More science, more drugs, more vaccines, more of everything that is coming out of technology and medicine is the answer to better health. That's that's one sort of solid camp that's out there. And then on the other end, you have people, you know, hardcore natural health proponents who are in a way trying to get back to living like our hunter-gatherer ancestors. <laughs> and and you're you're very much sort of walking this middle ground with as you implied there almost no allegiance to either camp but really just this 
commitment to doing whatever works. But how do you how do you perceive yourself as sort of walking between those two camps? Well, if you put yourself in a camp, you stopped thinking. And this is true politically. It's true from uh, like being a, a patriot of whatever your country is. You know, your country probably did some really bad things and is probably doing them right now. And that's okay. Countries do that. But you might as well be aware of it instead of putting on blinders. Mm -hmm. That's what camps do. They're for intellectually lazy people to say, oh, I'm just going to follow this basic set of rules, even if they don't work, because I feel safer following this basic set of rules. And if you're too lazy to do that, don't join a camp. Find people who are really curious, who are doing the work of curating good knowledge for you, and then follow them and let them do some of the thinking for you. But don't be in just one camp. One of the camps I used to be in when I was younger, when I was really working on losing this weight, I joined the raw vegan camp, right? Oh, and I just said, well, enzymes. <laughs> and I gave myself autoimmune diseases and I screwed up my health. I ended up having to create another diet to fix it. Right. I was in the all carbs are bad Atkins diet camp in the 90s. Yeah, I lost 50 pounds in three months. It took me 10 years to lose the other 50 pounds because it turns out it's not just about carbs being bad. In fact, carbs aren't bad. If you don't have them, you will very much hate your life and probably be unable to get an erection if you're in keto for long periods of time. No, that's not true for everyone, just most people. So there are ways to do it, but it's about measuring and improving. And that means you must be willing to consider stuff. So I did all the pharmaceutical stuff. I was not just fat, I'd had two, three knee surgeries before I was 23, chronic sinusitis for 15 years. I was on antibiotics almost every month because of these problems. Kind of miserable. Toxic mold was a major, a major trigger, it turns out, behind all of that, but no one knew at the time. And it's just one of those things you walk around feeling like crap all the time. And when I exhausted all the stuff that was supposed to work, I'm a computer science guy, I'm in Silicon Valley, I'm at the company that held Google's first servers when Google was just two employees and you know, two servers and had this amazing career going on. Meanwhile, my brain is like leaving my body and I don't really, really know what's going on. So I'm, I'm at this fascinating time where I really want to accelerate my career. My accelerator is pressed all the way to the floor and I'm slowing down and I'm slowing down. So you, of course you do all the stuff you're supposed to do that's Western med. And when I went to the doctor at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and said, I feel like I've been poisoned kind of, but I noticed if I take vitamin C, I feel a little bit better, but something's wrong, can you help me find it? And he said, vitamin C, you have to stop, it could kill you. And I looked at him and I said, what about Linus Pauling? Now, Linus Pauling won two Nobel prizes and was the largest proponent of vitamin C. He took 90 grams a day, which is probably excessive, but you know, he's an example that vitamin C probably won't kill you, he lived till his mid 80s. So, the doctor didn't know who he was, and I fired the doctor. And I said, I'm done with, with Western medicine entirely. And for four years, I didn't see a doctor until I went back to one and said, I need you, you're just a walking permission slip, was actually what I said. I just need you to <laughs> order labs. And, and to her credit, she said, you know, well, okay, Dave, uh, <laughs> you've clearly done your research. Can I at least order the lab tests you want to get? Like, like what order should we do them in? Uh -huh. And it turns out not just mold, I had Lyme as well and toxic metals, and I pretty much had all the bad stuff. So moral of the story, should you say all pharmaceuticals are bad? Because I was in that camp. Well, it's, it's absolutely stupid to do that. Aspirin is pretty darn useful. And you say, well, it's white willow bark extract from trees, really, so I'm gonna count that as natural. All right, let's up, the, let's up it a little bit. I took modafinil. This is the limitless drug, the most studied, most effective, broad-spectrum smart drug you can get. It's prescription. And it got me through Wharton Business School while I was working full time when I was dealing with really serious brain fog from my health. I took it every day for eight years and it totally improved everything about my life and it does not have substantial side effects. Am I grateful for that pharmaceutical? Yeah. Have I used antibiotics? That's so weird. I have because I was a, you know, have really bad infection. Like Western medication is really good for you. The ones you take all the time. You know what? I'm going to tell you a lot of people listening here will live another 10 years longer if you use some pharmaceuticals, right? They're actually that useful. Some that use chronically, like some antihistamines can be really powerful for aging. Some immunosuppressants can be powerful for aging taken once a week. So just don't be dogmatic. Like, look, is the juice worth the squeeze? There's a risk and there's a reward. And your risk and your reward will be different than mine because you might be a different gender. You might be a different age. You might have different genetic characteristics. But if you don't know what your risks are and you don't know what the risks of a medication are, either because it's been hidden, maybe you'll hear about it 75 years from now, 
And how can you make an intelligent decision? Well, what you, you're supposed to do is go to your doctor or your health provider or your naturopath or whoever can, you consult with and say, you know what? Here's what I'm interested in achieving for my health and my performance. Here's the things I'm concerned about given my genetics, given my family history, given you know the fact that I smoke three packs a day, whatever it is, right? Given that, what's the best course of action? And then you choose for you. And what governments and epidemiologists do is they say, oh, everyone's average, therefore we're gonna make everyone do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And here's what that does. Let's look at a class. You have some A students, you make them do the average thing, they become C students. But the F students become C students. So anytime an epidemiologist or a government says everyone has to do this, they're always taking the outlying high performers and screwing them over. Those are the people like Einstein who are out there. They're way orders of magnitude floating around out there. They're just different. And right now, they're actually trying to put digital systems in place to enforce behaviors that might not work for some people, especially people with mast cell activation problems. Mast cells are cells in your body, part of your immune system. They're like little landmines waiting to get set off. If you get stung by a bee and you puff up, that's mast cells. But they get there, it's a major part of inflammaging. So this is why you should work with your doctor and your doctor should have the right to say any pharmaceutical on the planet might be a good choice or might not be a good choice for you without interference from insurance companies or bureaucrats. Uh, and that's why you know I, I've been very vocal on my social channels saying, look, biological freedom is fundamentally important for you to live a long time and for you to feel good. What if they mandated antidepressants for everyone? Do you wanna be forced to take that? I don't, I don't think that's, that anyone has that right. Mm -hmm. Very well said, I agree with everything. Notice I didn't say that. the V word there. Yes, well done. Well done on that. <laughs> we won't get um, censored. I like the I like the seventy five years <laughs> remark too. I think probably a lot of people won't won't catch the reference there. But um, so I want to talk about diet. All right. You've alluded to this a couple times, but maybe let's start with the extremes. So, um, are you in the vegan camp or are you in the carnivore camp? And if not, why are you not in either of those camps? Okay. So I am in what we'll call the bulletproof diet camp. And I think we're at about 600,000 copies of the book in 16,000 languages. People lost more than a million pounds on the diet. And it's the one that's kept me from being hungry for a long time. And yes, I was a, a card carrying devout raw vegan than a regular vegan until it made me really ill. And it's made so many people sick to go plant-based. A lot of them I have worked with. In fact, just at New Year's, um, I um, sat with a vegan a very, very strident vegan when she had her first piece of bacon in 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. And it comes down to these three beliefs. I'm gonna kind of do the vegan takedown, then I'll yeah. do the carnivore takedown. Please. <laughs> Although if I had to choose between the two, I'd go carnivore, but it's not gonna end well either on that. Yeah. Um, and what, what happens with the vegan diet is animal rights terror groups who believe actually in writing that a human life is equivalent to a bunny life, that, that we're the same. Um, they will lie to you and tell you that a vegan diet is good for your health. They don't care about your health. All the anti-aging physicians, the thousands of them I've worked with, I lecture at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine to these doctors, and many of them are close friends. I've interviewed almost a thousand people like that on my show. 99 point something percent of them will tell you that vegans are the most unhealthy group they come across. Personal trainers will tell you, it's easy. Take a vegan, have them hang from a bar. Someone can walk in the door and a vegan will fall off the bar first. They can't hold on, followed by someone who eats KFC in the standard American diet, followed by someone who's on a healthier diet, which is going to be something that is probably more paleo-ish bulletproof and maybe the early stages of carnivore, but not the late stages. And what you end up with is just, it creates human weakness. That's the reality. I don't like that it's the reality. And the people say it's better for the environment. That is false. You need animal poop to make soil. And I say this as a regenerative agriculture farmer living about 200 feet right now from my sheep. Okay, where the animals poop, the stuff grows. Where the animals don't poop, we have depleted soils, which are a major problem. So plant-based diets don't work for that yet industrial meat is bad for you. So distributed grass-fed is the only way we can really make the planet go. 
Um, so there's not an environmental argument, there's not a health argument, and there's an animal cruelty argument. From an animal cruelty perspective, when I was in Tibet, and yes, I've traveled the world because when I realized, oh, this Western stuff isn't working, um, I'll try ayahuasca in South America. This is back when no white people did that. Literally, they said, you're white, you won't like it. <laughs> like, I know I'm white, but I really want to try this. Now it's a tourist industry in Peru. Yeah. But, uh, and then I went to Nepal and Tibet and I studied meditation with the masters there. And I was talking with the um, head uh, Lama at one of the large monasteries in Tibet. And I said, you tell me no killing and I see a yak skin on your prayer pole, you're a hypocrite. And he starts laughing at me and he goes, Dave, one death feeds everyone. And I have calculated the deaths per calorie for the Bulletproof Diet, which is based on only eating grass-fed or wild-caught stuff, or you just eat vegetables and, and things you just don't eat, industrial meat. You can eat a pound of meat every year and kill 0 0.5 animals per year, including all of the byproduct animals. Unless the cow stepped on a frog, nothing else died. And That's, the cow uh, led a sorry, good life. That was a pound of meat every, every day for a year? Yeah. Because a cow weighs a thousand pounds, right? And of course there's butcher weight in bones and you can do all sorts of calculations, what breed of cow, whatever. But it's about between 0.3 and 0.5 deaths <laughs> for the entire year. But a bowl of you know impossible soy nuggets, okay, how much habitat destruction happened? Because the cow is on, is on a field that you didn't have to destroy. There's actually an ecosystem there. There's mice and there's other stuff, there's bugs. There are not those where they grow soy. It's literally just dead soil. And what happens there is habitat destruction. And if there are animals, once you run that tractor through and cut everything down, there's no animals except pieces of them. So all the bunnies, turtles, so you, wait a minute, you mean my bowl of cereal killed more animals, destroyed more environment, depleted more soil than the steak? That's the reality. And then people say, but I have plant-based protein. Plant-based protein always comes with things that keep plants from being food, unless you're an herbivore with three stomachs for that, and mostly phytic acid. So you can't absorb the minerals. They deplete your minerals and you end up with low bone density. I just had a surgery on my foot and the doctor is saying, this is weird, my bone saw is slowing down on his bones. I've never seen bone density like this. That's because I get enough minerals from my food. Okay, is so be, is this because you installed some steel rods in there and your biohacking efforts or some adamantium? I have laser toes now. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I was an old yoga injury, actually. Mm -hmm. But okay, so that's our, our vegan side of things. It simply doesn't work for the planet and it doesn't work for the animals, yet industrial meat is bad. So don't eat industrial meat, but you can support a local farmer. Now, let's get into the carnivore thing. When I stress tested the Bulletproof Diet, and the Bulletproof Diet is to be, to be as simple as I can make it, here's the list of veggies that will not inflame your body. It's a short list. And you go in ketosis for brief periods of time, and you practice intermittent fasting. And this is a diet that's now 12 years old. <laughs> and it works so well, which means instead of breakfast, you have butter, MCT oil and coffee. This is well known as Bulletproof Coffee. I'm the founder of Bulletproof. We've done a half a billion dollars in sales or something like that over the life of the company. By the way, I'll, I'll mention briefly on that. I'm down here in Costa Rica. I don't know if you know that. Nice. I'm in a, in a small town called Nosara. Oh, and cool. at my favorite restaurant down here, they actually offer Bulletproof Coffee. They offer, right. in fact, two varieties of it. A Canadian wow. version with uh, some kind of I think they call it Macanto maple flavored monk fruit sweetener or something yep. like that. It doesn't taste like as good as the original, but anyway, just a, a testament so cool. to your, uh, your success that you've reached far all over the world with it, uh, bulletproof coffee. It's become a, a kind of a, almost hard to believe. I've seen signs of small villages in India with a sign that says bulletproof coffee. It, clearly it's not the actual <laughs> bulletproof brand, yeah. but the idea of putting butter in MCT oil or grass-fed butter to be clear, because regular butter doesn't work. Um, if doing that blending it and putting it in your coffee, it has, I, it's hard to know how many people have done that, but it's pro it's done at least, at least a billion times. And um, it's, it's changed a lot of people's brains. It, it works exceptionally well. And I'm really grateful for that. And now there's all kinds of companies selling collagen and MCT oil. Just finding clean coffee is really tough. And in fact, I am not working with Bulletproof at all uh, right now. I'm I'm still a shareholder, um, but I am not on the board. I'm not involved with them. 
and is part of my new Upgrade Labs uh, venture, uh, which is a, a facility that lets you get more exercise and more recovery in way less time than going to the gym. Um, I'm actually going to, that company will be selling my new, uh, my new brand of coffee, which is of course mold free, but has some other characteristics that no coffee has had to date. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to launch that. Well, cool. can you talk about what those characteristics are? Um, when are we going to put this I, podcast up? top secret? Um, I can, I can postpone it a few weeks if you want. I can postpone it for like maybe, uh, six weeks at the most. Hmm. I wonder. Um, yeah, I think I can talk about it. Just, you got to check with me before you pub before you publicize it, if, if okay. that works. I'm um, just yeah. so we, we can do it. Um, and where am I going to send people? Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Well, the URL for the new coffee right now is my mystery mm. And actually, let me just double check that. Yep. There you go. If you go to mymysterycoffee.com, that's where the list is to get the new coffee. And what I've done is I've, of course, made sure that it's mold-free. And, and just a word about mold in coffee. People say, what, mold? I, I don't see any mold in my coffee. The way coffee works is that when it's on the plant growing, insects bite the coffee. And they put little spores of molds that are that make toxins that are bad for people. So it's not that the mold is present, it's that the poison is present. When you take penicillin, you're not taking a fungus or you're not taking a mold, you're actually taking an extract of a mold. And what ends up in your coffee is something called okra toxin A. So those little fertilized or inoculated beans in a normal coffee plant, they'll sit there for two or three days in river water, kind of spoiling and fermenting and growing bad stuff. Then they dry them in the sun, uh, then they dry them in a dryer and they ship them to you, but the toxins are already present and the toxins are stable in heat. And you could say that sounds like a bunch of hippie BS, to be perfectly honest, but most countries on the planet have government limits for the amount of this toxin that's allowed in coffee because it's so bad for your bladder and kidneys. And it gives, in my experience, it gives people anxiety and jitters and sugar cravings after they have coffee. The US and Canada have no standards at all. And I have on video a former president of the Specialty Coffee Association talking about the time he was in Japan. And Japan rejected 1,000 shipping containers of coffee because they did not meet the mold toxin standards. And I said, what did you do with these? And he said, we sent them to the U.S. because it's legal there. So if you feel crappy after a certain cup of coffee, you either get, you feel up and then down or you get really strong sugar cravings after it. It's not the coffee. It's what the coffee has in it because it was processed wrong. So the new coffee uh, that I'm coming out with, that mymysterycoffee.com, it is one that has a very, very clean steps made during manufacturing. Of course, it's lab tested, but it also has some minerals, more than 50 different kinds of minerals added back in. I mentioned earlier that people are mineral deficient right now. So what if in, with every cup of coffee, you got minerals that your body could actually absorb? So we've filed for patents on ways of combining the minerals with the coffee in such a way that they can be absorbed well into your cells. And now you're getting way more minerals than you were before and the coffee tastes amazing. Those minerals also stick to other toxins in your body to help them get out of the body. So it's uh, basically the ultimate high performance coffee. I'm pretty excited to be doing this. Awesome. And it was mymysterycoffee.com. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So we kind of digressed down this. We were mm -hmm. talking vegan oh, yeah, versus carnivore. carnivore. Okay. Yeah. So, so on the bulletproof thing, you do that in the morning. Carnivore people will oftentimes tell you that any plant is bad for you. So I'm, I'm stress testing the bulletproof diet. And so I went carnivore-ish. I did have a few herbs, but I ate only meat and fat and eggs for three months. And during the first six weeks, I'm like, yes, I feel so good. And I was also doing extra calories during that time just to sort of show that, okay, I'm not going to get fat from eating extra calories. And I did not gain weight on it. I lost weight on it. Problem was, by the end of three months, my sleep score went way down. I've been monitoring my sleep every night for 15 years. And all of a sudden, I'd wake up after nine hours of sleep. I normally sleep six and a half hours. That's all I need. And... I'd wake up and I'd feel like I didn't sleep. And then my my 
technology would show me that I was waking up a dozen times at night and not knowing it. And then I noticed the other things that always happen when people go carnivore. <laughs> okay. They feel great for a while. I call this the carnivore trap. It's the same as the fasting trap, the keto trap, or the vegan trap. It's that if something is good, more must be better. Mm -hmm. But women hit the carnivore trap before men do. And I've, I have a bunch of friends who went carnivore. I'm like, guys, I already tried this. Here's what's going to happen. Um, animal protein and particularly animal fat from grass fed animals are really good for you. That's not to say that you don't need some ability to feed the good bacteria in your gut because they get stressed. They make something called lipopolysaccharides. So what you do is you can go full carnivore for three or four or five or seven days, but then you have a meal that includes some soluble fiber, also known as prebiotic fiber, or you could be carnivore and take some of that every day. The reason that we're all confused about this is that the body actually is meant to run on glucose much of the time, and it can run on ketones some of the time. So you can teach it to run on ketones. You do that by intermittent fasting or by being carnivore for at least three days, or you could teach it that by adding MCT oil to your coffee. It's less work, and MCT oil has other benefits. But when you do that, now you have a metabolism that can burn fat or can burn carbohydrates for energy. When you go full carnivore, you lose the ability to metabolize carbohydrates for energy and your gut bacteria move in a way that isn't good. And in the carnivore space, um, one, of my, uh, one of my friends, Paul Saladino, has ended up, well, guys, I actually feel better if I have some honey, which is you know, animal-based, uh, along with it. Oh, and I eat the less inflammatory plants. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I'm recommending on the Bulletproof Diet with intermittent fasting. So in the morning, don't have much, eat most of your food in the middle of the day, have some carbs if you're not trying to lose weight. And if you're trying to lose weight, cut the carbs a little bit and be in ketosis some of the time. And that will keep you going for decades. I'm also a fan of adding prebiotic fiber that, that in studies feeds good gut bacteria. You can add that to your coffee, you can have it somewhere in your diet, and you look at ancestral diets, they would chew on fibrous stuff to get the soluble fiber. It's mostly plant saps. So some of that is good for you, but most plants, they just wanna kill you. And this idea that you're gonna eat a big kale salad and feel good, no. No one feels good after a kale salad. They don't even wanna eat it unless it has bacon and maple syrup on it. And even then you're gonna be hungry and you'll get kidney stones later. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of from a guy who's blended at least 100 pounds of kale and gave myself oxalic acid poisoning. Okay, so within the, the biohacking community or the biohacking niche, let's say, um, it seems like there is a new device, uh, some kind of new wearable technology on the market every week. And I've been kind of watching this unfold for 10 years now. And I kind of chuckle. I'm like, you know, to some extent, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, what, what does it look like if someone buys every one of these devices that comes out on the market? They're going to, they're going to, every, every time they leave the house, they're going to have 30 different wearable devices on them. Right. And at a certain point, it, it's becoming like a cyborg, except it's much more cumbersome. And then you got to check your apps, 30 different apps to get all the data. So given that that whole space has expanded so much and you've been in it, you know, from the very beginning, what, what do you say are the top wearable biohacking devices on the market right now? I'm going to turn your question around a, a little bit and, and say, track what you hack. At the very beginning of this movement, there's a group called Quantified Self, and I, I was an early member of the group, and we are saying, how are we going to get the data from the human body? No one's ever done this. So my background is getting data from data centers, you know, working in Silicon Valley, so I, I'm all about that. My whole career has been you know, performance enhancement and systems management for tech. And so well, what if I turn this around to myself? So. If you're looking at growing muscle, then you would look at tech that monitors the things that help you grow muscle. If you're looking at getting a better night's sleep, then you'd look at a sleep tracker, right? If you're looking at fixing your posture, there are things I'll remind you every time you hunch over so that you sit up straighter, so you get one of those. It is a fool's errand to buy 30 different things and stick them all over your body because you actually can't concentrate on that many things. And then what you end up with is a very rich data set, but it's too rich for you to take action on, so then you need machine learning. That's where we're going, where you'll have enough effortless monitoring that 
I can, oh, okay, now I just get really good recommendations from an algorithm. And hopefully it's an algorithm that's transparent. I don't want Facebook running that algorithm because they don't care about my health. They'll probably steer me to drive myself into a wall because they would make more money. Uh, so you don't want that, that behind your machine learning. So all of that said, the number one thing that has the most return on investment for people in terms of data is a sleep tracker. And my favorite one is the Aura Ring, O-U-R-A. And as I mentioned, just full disclosure, I'm a small investor, I'm an advisor to the company, uh, but I was also a co-founder and CTO of another company that did that, that we sold to Intel like 10 years ago or something. So I know the space really well. The reason I like this ring is, well, you charge it maybe once a week and it's seamless and it's not in the way. You don't have a big blinky watch. It doesn't do anything unless you look at your phone in the morning and then you know, did I do a good job sleeping last night? And most, most importantly, that's so weird. I slept eight hours like I normally do, but I really got terrible sleep. And you realize it's not about the length of your sleep, it's about the quality of your sleep. And when you fix the quality of your sleep, your cognitive performance goes up, your physical performance goes up, your blood sugar regulation goes up, your risk of diabetes goes down, your risk of cancer goes down, and everything gets better. So sleep is a highly leveraged thing. And you can get sleep trackers that start under 100 bucks. If you want the very cheapest but still effective, there's a company called Sleep Space, which is backed by a university uh, researcher named Dan Gartenberg. I'm also an investor advisor in those guys. Your phone all by itself can not only track your sleep with accuracy, it can enhance your deep sleep and your REM sleep. That one's called Sleep Space. So those are two things. Y you carry a huge biohacking device in your hand. Your phone can do crazy amounts of cognitive training, um, all kinds of feedback, even some now based on how your eyes move. So just don't worry about getting all the data. Don't worry about being perfect. Say, what do I care about? What's one thing I can track until I get it right? And I've, I've got to also in that mention, number of steps per day is absolute BS. I've been saying this since I was at one of those early fitness tracker companies that was called Basis. The 10,000 steps a day came from a company in Japan in 1956. They came out with the first little thing you clipped on your belt that tracked the number of steps, a pedometer. And they just needed a marketing campaign. So they made up 10,000 steps and said, this is what the goal should be. And to this day, you see billion dollar tech companies saying, you need your 10,000 steps a day. It's garbage. You, people who walk 10,000 steps a day, they just wear their joints out and then they eat more to compensate for the extra energy demand. It's not based in science. You'll be happier with 6,000 if you're an average person. Well, we could go on a whole digression about how much of things that are uh, purported to be scientific con consensus are just made up by some person at some point. For example, right now, you know, the whole space six feet apart, social distancing stuff. Um, it's not oh, exactly, no, in, in it didn't Europe, exactly come from randomized it, control yeah. studies where they tested the transmission of, of COVID at different distances. Somebody it's, just made it up. It's complete garbage thinking. And anyone like teenagers figure this out right away. The problem when governments come out, or sometimes you know, people with scientific robes of power come out with just completely obviously BS recommendations like that is it teaches teenagers and anyone who can think never trust them again. Oh yeah. Uh, so I talked to my kids, they're outraged. Oh, the school says I have to wear a mask here, but not here, but we're right next to each other here. So if they work, then if they let us do this, then there's no need, like, like it doesn't make sense and it makes people angry. So yeah. stupid recommendations just to say you're meeting them, um, they actually are attacks on, on human consciousness. And I don't think people are gonna stand for much more of that. Um, over time, governments tend to grow the number of regulations until they basically clog the arteries of civilization. Mm -hmm. And that's happening with health regulations right now. All, everything the government's ever told you about what to eat has been proven wrong. <laughs> so there's that. So why am I gonna trust them with anything about my health? I, it's not their job to keep me safe. <laughs> it's not their job to tell me what to eat. It's their job to let me make my decisions and not harm others. And that's well, it. it. Seems they're, they're pretty confused about that right now. So given how long you've been um, part of, not only part of the biohacking community, but pioneering the biohacking space, after all these years, what would you say are your top 
biohacking strategies, maybe your top three. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to add the, the, the nuance here of if someone is struggling with energy levels, if they're struggling with fatigue in particular, what would you say are your top three biohacks to experiment with? Well, the first one is one that I already mentioned. It's fixing your sleep. And I will tell you everything I know in the shortest possible time. Go to sleepwithdave.com. It is free. <laughs> and this is my is this, sleep. is this only for women, Dave? Um, it's for anyone. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm very flexible that way. <laughs> it's the best URL I could find. But I will. Uh, uh, it's also something you won't forget because uh, Sleep with Dave is hilarious. At least I think it is. And uh, uh, what's going on there is you can change the environment that you sleep in. That very definition of biohacking. And oftentimes it's very very cheap things. Like most people don't know if you raise. The, the head of your bed by six inches, so you're at a slight angle, that it totally changes the flow of fluids in your body at night so you can more effectively clean your brain with clean cerebral spinal fluid. That's a one-time purchase of two bricks. Like, we can was, all do this. Was, was that elevating the head of the bed? Just the or? head, yeah. Okay, so I've seen some recommendations from some people lately. I know Michael Greger and I think also Dr. Huberman. Someone, I, I, I will say I could be wrong about Huberman because someone, I'm getting this through a third party, but someone asked me saying that, that Huberman actually elevated the foot of the bed. And I know Michael Greger is advising that. And yeah. Huberman, based on what this person said, could be wrong, um, was saying that it would help glymphatic drainage from the brain which doesn't intuitively make or logically make sense to me. What you're, what you're saying makes sense because of gravity, obviously helping fluid yeah. flow down out of the brain. But and there are I'm multiple studies. Heard I, I've heard of it. There are multiple studies out of Germany um, that support raising the head of the bed. I don't know of any studies that support the foot of the bed. Okay. And you also look at the way our ancestors slept, and I do sleep on a very hard surface uh, the way they did, which improves uh, piezoelectric signaling in the body. Actually, you feel much better. For the first six weeks, you hate your life, and after that, everything is much better. But, uh, and that probably improves lymphatic circulation as well. All humans would sleep with their head uphill. Anyone who's gone backpacking, it, it's uncomfortable to sleep with their head downhill. Also, all animals do that. So given what I know about animals, because my sheep are free range on my property, they walk everywhere, they will eat exactly one leaf of the herb that is anti-parasitic, because that's what they needed. And they know if they eat 20 leaves, it's gonna be bad for them. So we know intuitively how to best take care of our, of our biology. There's a reason that we wanna sleep with our head slightly elevated. So I, given the studies I've seen and given, uh, given that evidence and just given what you see in the world around you, uh, I, I would elevate the head of the bed. And there is some interesting things about perhaps you ought to aim the head of your bed in alignment with one of the cardinal directions and there's debates about that. I don't know about that. But I, so I don't talk about that in, in the Sleep with Dave uh, sleep challenge. But what I do also talk about is blacking out the room. There's a study that shows the amount of of light that comes around normal curtains in the average city is enough to increase depression by 69%. This is a study of 800. This was a, a men only study, but it's likely true in women as well. It's circadian disruption. So one of my companies is around circadian biology. It's called True Dark. We have patented or patent pending glasses that, that control way more than just blue light, but blacking out your room is dirt cheap. You just need good blackout curtains with Velcro or magnets around the edges so no light gets in and you tape over or unplug every LED of any color. And when you do that, magically, you get more sleep per hour. So I go through a long list of things like this. And yes, there's cool sleep trackers you can embed into your mattress that change the temperature of your mattress. You can change your thermostat. You can control when you eat. There's all kinds of cool stuff. The um, dimming the lights before bed or wearing the true dark glasses, all of those make a difference, but it's all cheap. And so that's only one of them. But man, if you fix your sleep, everything else is easier to do, including the next recommendation, which is intermittent fasting. And would you imagine fast with Dave? <laughs> we'll take you to the fasting challenge. Again, this is free. It's just a gift. And I wrote a book on fasting called fast this way a New York times bestseller. There's two kinds of fasting. Both of them appear terrifying if you've never fasted before. One of them is a performance working fast, and one of them is a spiritual fast. And when you do it right, you can fast and feel better 
during the day than you did when you had breakfast. You're not distracted by food. You have more energy, more focus, more time because you didn't have to make time making breakfast and you actually save money because you didn't have breakfast. And in that challenge I teach you or in the book, I teach you three different hacks to make it so the first time you fast, you won't be hungry and you still get the benefits of fasting. And that's a, a major, a major thing to do. And also to face the fear that all animals have of starving to death. It's not a conscious fear. It's an unconscious fear and where that sits in the hierarchy of your body. Um, so there's our, our first two, um, sleep and intermittent fasting. And the third one, we go in a couple of different directions. You said for someone who's having brain fog or energy, it was a brain fog or fatigue. being tired all the time. Fatigue, fatigue. but brain fog over, overlaps with okay. people with chronic fatigue a lot. Yeah, man, having lived that chronic fatigue thing, it's it's really rough. Um, well, for chronic fatigue specifically, I, I was going to go into cold therapy. I've been recommending that for 10 years. Some new research that Huberman's talking about uh, mirrors almost exactly the, the recommendations that we just arrived at as a community from early studies. Mm -hmm. So uh, Susan Soderberg has done great work on that. Um, so I could talk about cold therapy, but people who are really tired all the time they probably will benefit from cold therapy unless they're really blown out from an adrenal perspective. Then they're too tired. Cold therapy is too much of a stress and they should start with just getting their face cold instead of their whole body. Mm -hmm. And so there's protocols for that um, that that I'm not going to get into because I think it's too specialized. The, um, the next one, um, so then if we're not going to do that, would also be high intensity interval training. Except if you have really serious chronic fatigue, you're just exhausted all the time. You know what exercise does? It makes you tired like and, and that's that's what's supposed to do so there have been times when i'm like okay i'm not getting enough sleep i'm right on the edge of some respiratory thing uh and i'm working really hard and i just flew and yeah i know i should go exercise but i just feel like crap and it makes me feel worse when exercise not better so what I'm going to suggest for people who are that blown out is you actually focus on recovery and sleep and nutrition. So my final thing, if, if I have someone who's really got cognitive dysfunction and fatigue is going to be have coffee in the morning only, add butter, add MCT oil and blend it. I have had multiple people over the years go off of ADD medications. Uh, and this is a major energy enhancer. It changes the way your body metabolizes caffeine. And I discovered uh, this recipe after I went to Tibet and I had yak butter tea at 18,000 feet elevation. I was still dealing with the lingering effects of chronic fatigue and I drank blended tea and, and butter and I felt amazing when there was no oxygen in the air and it didn't make any sense. And I came back to Silicon Valley and I tried a thousand different recipes and figured out the mold free coffee and the MCT oil. But the idea of blending it, I funded research at the University of Washington that proved that droplets of butter and MCT oil in water and probably coffee because coffee is mostly water make it changes the structure of the water so that your body can immediately use that water inside of cells. When you or I drink water, Ari, just a cup of water, your body has to distribute the water throughout the cells, hold the water near the cell membranes, which are made of fat, and heat the water with 1200 nanometer infrared light. That's body heat. <laughs> and after a little while, the water transforms its viscosity, how runny or thick it is, so that then we can use the water to make energy. When you blend even just a tiny bit of fat in the water for 20 seconds or in coffee, the coffee, the water in that, you can use it when you drink it. So now you're getting water that's immediately usable to make ATP, and you're getting instant energy from the MCT, which gives you keto energy, which is good for you, uh, and you get a bunch of other benefits. That fixes so many people. And if not, hit the smart drugs. You wanted to perform well right now? There are things that are gray market pharmaceuticals like aniracetam. There's the limitless drug I talked about earlier, modafinil. And you know what? Your job is to feel really good right now. What most people do is they suffer for two or three years when they're recovering. You don't have to suffer. You can feel good tomorrow while you recover your adrenals. And that's what I teach a lot of people on, on my podcast. Like, here's, here's all the techniques, the things you need to know. You have a right to feel good tomorrow. And if you're not feeling good, change what you're doing. You can recover and feel good. And my company, Upgrade Labs, where I'm putting most of my time right now, 
We're franchising across the country with facilities that have all the tech that let you recover faster than Mother Nature intended. Oh, and if you wanted muscles or cardio or brain upgrades, we've got those in very small amounts of time. Because frankly, lifting weights, picking up rocks is what we've done throughout all of human history, or running away from tigers or chasing deer. Those are the only two kinds of exercise we can do better with tech. So I'm using AI to guide your body to put on more muscle or to fix your cardiovascular system in way less time so you can spend the extra time fixing your brain. So you can go that deep if you want to, but seriously, use something that is from a plant or a pharmaceutical company that will make you feel like yourself right now. Dave, do you have to run right this second or can I ask you one more? Okay. Yeah, we've got time. Um, I, I have I have a super quick question and then- sure. One, one more uh, that might be We have like 10 more, 10 more minutes should be, should be good. Okay. Um, the, the quick question is on Bulletproof, there is a segment of people, and I know some cardiologists that are, that are friends of mine that have commented on this in the past, that certain people just respond to consumption of dairy fat and their, their LDL just skyrockets. And so there's a segment of people that maybe are just genetically susceptible to that. Do you, do you have any insight into that? Because I know that certain cardiologist friends of mine have commented specifically on, you know, seeing people who have switched to Bulletproof where, where that happens. Obviously, it doesn't happen with everybody, but any comments on the, the sort of minority of people that that does happen to? Well, there's a class of people who have something called uh, familial hypercholesteremia. So in their family, they always have very high cholesterol. And a dear friend of mine is one of those who has consulted with the top cardiologists around the country around this exact question. And we've had some really good, you know, off the record conversations about it. So I've dug into that a lot. And at the end of the day, uh, the most trustworthy of all of the different advisors said, you know what? We don't have any evidence that this is actually harmful to you. It may actually be an adaptive response. You actually see that much more in Ashkenazi uh, Jewish people, um, believe it or not. There's a lot of unusual genetic variations in that population. Also, some genetic variations that gives them the highest average IQ of any, any um, racial group on the planet, which is pretty cool. So, um, at least in, uh, in these cases where people have this, if they're not all dying of, of these issues, then what's going on? What I recommend people do is focus on triglycerides. And there's a ratio of HDL to triglycerides. HDL is the so-called good protective cholesterol. When people go bulletproof, the vast, vast majority of people, they raise their HDL to levels that are like, wow, that's so good. And their triglycerides drop through the floor. And that combination is more cardioprotective than worrying about straight LDL. So when people are in these advanced things, there are a group of cardiologists who look at the size of the particles and different people will do different things. Some particle sizes are worse than others. But the two numbers or well, three numbers that I really, really pay attention to are LP PLA2. This is an enzyme that gets released when there's damage to the lining of your arteries. So if your high LDL is damaging you, this number must go up. So if LP PLA2 is not elevated, then the cholesterol, funny enough, is correlated with living longer, higher LDL. People who live very long have higher LDL levels and LDL helps you excrete toxins out of the body. So it's not necessarily bad. You would look at oxidized LDL, OX LDL, because that is dangerous. This is LDL that is creating free radicals because it's been damaged and you don't want that. That comes from eating highly oxidized cholesterol, which you don't wanna do and I recommend not doing uh, in the diet. Uh, and then you can look at the other markers of inflammation like homocysteine and C-reactive protein. So most people who go, quote, bulletproof uh, on the diet or any of the recommendations from fast this way will find that there is a, um, that, that all of those markers improve. If they don't, there's a genetic reason homocysteine is around your ability to process B vitamins and methyl groups, so then you fix that. If C-reactive protein is high, you have a chronic infection or some other injury that's causing persistent things. You have to get these numbers down if you wanna live a long time and feel good. And so what, what I have to say is, to, to the cardiologist, and I very much respect what cardiologists do. Okay, I know LDL was easy to measure because we could see it 50 years ago. And the fact we have a ton of studies 
doesn't mean that that's the thing you should look at. Look at what we know today and take the old stuff with a grain of salt uh, because you know you can track the movement of stars and correlate them with everything because that's all you can track. But it turns out looking at your genetics might be more accurate and more actionable even if maybe there was data from the movement of the stars. So we're getting to that point with medicine and in cardiology, you show me that LPPLA2, <laughs> show me homocysteine, show me CRP, and if the LDL is at 300 in the patient, explain where the damage is happening, right? And if there is damage, oh, it's calcification. So let's look at our K2 and D3 levels, shall we? And eventually we'll do that. There's also people who have an APO um, E3 and 4 variation in their genetics um, in that population. And I've written about this years ago on the Dave Asprey blog. Um, it turns out that you may want to put more oleic acid in the diet. In other words, you use a greater portion of olive oil. But all of us, and this is also core to the, the Bulletproof Diet when I first wrote it, minimize your consumption of seed oils, the omega-6 oils. And if you eat them, they need to be raw and not cooked. So soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil are super bad for you. And so in that population, you can have olive oil, but it needs to be high quality olive oil that hasn't been fried yeah. uh, and doing that tends to help. And some people, to be really clear, you can suppress hunger on a zero fat, high starch, probably pro-cancer diet, uh, like the Pritikin diet, which I just cannot recommend. But a lot of cardiologists are saying, oh, you know, th there's some evidence of reversal of heart disease from this insane low fat diet. However, the depletion that creates in the body is so high that, that it it just doesn't work for large populations, especially uh, for people who want to feel good. Mm -hmm. very, I will say on a personal note, what you said is, is very interesting because I'm actually one of those people that my, when I eat a lot of saturated fat, particularly dairy fat, my LDL goes up pretty dramatically. I'm, I'm also 57% Ashkenazi. So I, I, actually didn't know, <laughs> I actually didn't know that link though. Wow, I did not know that you were any Ashkenazi, but there, there's a definite correlation there. Not all Ashkenazi heritage people are going to have that. Right. But it, remember, LDL cholesterol is protective of toxins. It helps to escort toxins out of the body. And now I, I'm gonna go out on a limb a little bit here, but if there's any population that has had pressure on it, there's actually a great book, a little red book about why uh, um, the Ashkenazi Jews, but I'm not Jewish, um, but why Ashkenazi Jews have the highest average IQ on the planet. And it has to do with pressure on the population from being hunted for a thousand plus years, just to be really blunt about it, right? Mm -hmm. So that meant that the people who survived these really unfortunate times with famine and, and other bad things happening were the ones who could handle toxins the best, who could handle famine the best, who had the most amazing immune systems, Right. So when only a few people are going to make it out of a place, it was the strongest ones. And you do that for generation after generation, which, which is horrible. But what you end up with is, huh, why is there high cholesterol? Is it protective? And I know I'm probably angering some cardiologists out there and I apologize, guys. Um, but you've got to look at that. Like, show me LPPLA2. Show me what's happening. Because if you tell me high cholesterol is dangerous, that is not what the data shows. You have to at least talk about particle counts. Um, so... The, the guy I'm talking about uh, in particular was on a low-fat diet and was dealing with what he describes crippling exhaustion his entire life, uh, and at least since he was 17, and he went on cholesterol-lowering drugs. And when he went on the Bulletproof diet, he got his energy back for the first time in his adult life and was just like, I can't believe this, but very much struggled with this. Well, if I eat dairy fat, my cholesterol goes up. I don't think it matters that much as long as your triglycerides don't go up and as long as your oxidized LDL doesn't go up. So it's like, show me the damage. I don't know where it's going to be. Yeah. Okay. I have one last question. I'm sure you got to run. I have to run to another podcast right now as well. So that I'm seven minutes late for. Oops. Um, last question. What does the first hour of your day look like? What does your morning ritual look like? And then we'll wrap up. Well, I leave my phone on airplane mode when I wake up until I drop one of my kids off at school, uh, usually. Uh, I will look at my phone, though, because I wake up and I look at my Aura Ring score to see, hmm, how did I do last night? And on a normal night, I sleep almost exactly six and a half hours with about two hours of deep sleep and an hour and a half of REM sleep, which is more than most college students get in eight hours. So my sleep hygiene is pretty good at this point, unless I did something wrong and then I know what I did and it was my fault and I earned it. So 
Um, that's what I do. Um, then I wake up, I do make a, a cup of coffee. Sometimes I do it black. I'm obviously using my new coffee beans from my mysterycoffee.com. Uh, I'll be unveiling the name shortly. And uh, sometimes I put MCT in butter and prebiotics, and sometimes I don't, just depending on my day, how I feel, what I want to do. I take a handful of supplements, uh, mostly cognitive enhancers and empty stomach things like amino acids that work well. Uh, and then I will usually do some sort of 10-15 minute visualization uh, from a variety of different places or just my own stuff. Uh, and then I go about uh, go about my day. It's usually family stuff. After the kids are dropped off at school, I do a set of things from Upgrade Labs, whether it's light therapy or one of the other ones I'm testing out. I have a bunch of biohacks. All of them are way more effective than exercise ever will be. And that's my goal. Sometimes neurofeedback from 40 years of Zen, my neuroscience company. But I'll do one of those hacks and then I go about my day. Awesome. Dave, I would love to hang out with you for lots more and find out all the details of the 30 plus supplements that you take every day and lots more about your routines and stuff. We both have to run. Uh, so let people know where they can follow your work. You obviously mentioned My Mystery Coffee and Sleep with Dave, but anywhere else you want to direct people to? Yeah. Um, just go to daveasprey.com. That is where there's 3,000 articles, almost 1,000 hours of video. And there you can sign up for my Upgrade Collective where I'll just teach you all this stuff. I have a course for every book I've ever done, a structured course that's you know, five, 10 minutes a week. So you can absorb it without having to read the book if you don't want to. I just want people to know the stuff because it'll save you tens of thousands of dollars in medical bills and pain throughout your life. And you'll feel better all the, all the time. And when people feel better, they're nicer to each other and they're harder to program by fear in the media. So I want an unprogrammable kind group of people around me and I'm working to create that. And so are you, Ari. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate the work you're doing, uh, particularly in the last couple of years. Thank you. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next